Sister Amina Blake was probably one of the youngest converts to Islam. A very interesting story. Her journey to Islam is what we are going to ask her about today. Please come with us. Sister Amina, how was uh, your journey to Islam uh, started? What attracted you to Islam? I think initially um, the the journey started with Subhanallah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. I think starts people's journeys actually before they're even born. And my <laughs> Subhanallah, my context of birth was that um, my uh, birth mother actually gave me up for adoption. Um, and hence I ended up coming to Sheffield uh, to be with uh, my adopted parents. But through that, I started getting to know Muslims. My father was a professor of English language and linguistics at the University of Sheffield. And he had a very diverse group of students, people from Masar, people from Philistine, people from all different places of the world. Um, and so through that, I got to know, I would not say Islam, but some elements of the Muslim culture. So when I was brought up, I was actually brought up as a Christian. Now, my journey as a Christian was, um, I would say, up and down, because I always believed that there was a God. I always believed that there was the one God. And I actually tell you a funny story, actually. I used to um, come up the driveway to mum and dad's house um, when I was a teenager, and I used to be late home. i have been told to be in at a certain time, my curfew, and I was late, and as I was walking up the driveway, I used to pray, and I used to just say, oh God, please, please God, don't let me be in trouble for being late home after my, <laughs> my night out. Um, and actually, the, this prayer was answered because I never actually got into trouble. But with Christianity, I always used to question, not the stories of the Bible, I always used to love the stories of the Bible, stories of the prophet, mm -hmm. but I always used to question the concept of uh, the Trinity, is it because of something you heard or just it came to you? It was really something that because um, I was Church of England, so um, as opposed to the Catholic Church, it's not so much focused on um, Mary, Mother of God and Isa uh, Salam and, and God himself. Really, the Protestant faith or Church of England is, I guess, more focused on um, Jesus Christ as the saviour. But also, I, I couldn't understand or couldn't grasp the concept that why would the Creator need a son? So how can somebody be God and Son of God at the same time? And then what happens when the Son of God dies on the cross? Then where's God? So I was asking all these questions. Now, another one of the problems that I had with Christianity was the authenticity of the Bible. And so I would question, OK, if this is the word of God, why am I finding contradictions? Mm -hmm. Why am I finding things that I'm not comfortable with? And hence, I need to uh, know about this. So I approached the vicar at the local church. I said, OK, well, you're telling me that the Bible's the, the, the word of God and this is unchangeable. Yes. Prove it because I'm a very black and white person. And you did this at a young age? I did this at quite a young age, maybe 16, 17 years old. So as a, as a result of this, I really exited Islam, but didn't exit belief itself. And then I started mixing more with Muslims. Exited Islam? Sorry, exited Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I had to, exited Christianity, and but I wasn't really mm -hmm. particularly looking for anything else. But I didn't exit. Yeah, belief. but someone who has 
uh, these uh, sort of uh, suspicions or uh, these uh, questions about uh, one's faith might go anywhere. Why Islam? What made you be, what attracted you to Islam? Well, I had a lot of Muslim friends. Um, when I was at school, I used to go to school with Muslims, not always the best behave of Muslims. Mm. <laughs> and when I was a teenager, one of my close friends, who was a Muslim girl, I used to go nightclubbing with her. And this is what really led me to looking into Islam itself. It ended up that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put me in the situation where I had to leave home. And the only place for me to go, every door was closed except her door. So I went and I stayed with her for several weeks. And as a daughter of a professor, I was very interested in books. And she had only one book in her entire house. And that was the Quran. SubhanAllah, from night clubbing to seeking refuge in her house to reading the Quran. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides mm. us in the most amazing of ways. So I saw this one book and it was actually up on her windowsill. And I said to her, well, what, what's this book? I'm interested. Oh, it's the Quran. Can I have a look? And she said, well, go and wash your hands first and, um, you know, have a look at the Quran. And this particular version of the Quran, I remember very clearly, it was the Yusuf Ali version mm. of the Quran. And so the, the English, voluminous one. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. A huge, great big book. And it was blue. And I remember holding this book and feeling kind of, quite strange, opening it and seeing the text. Now, the text in this particular translation is quite, quite archaic. It's quite old fashioned. Mm. And so having come from a biblical background and reading these stories of actually the same prophets that I'd seen and loved during my biblical upbringing, I didn't realize because in schools um, across the West, Islam and Christianity are taught as two separate things. So God is God, Allah is Allah. Mm. So there's there's no uh, similarities as between the two. As if they the were two. two different deities. As if it's a two dif two different deities. And mm. I had I'd never realised that Allah is God and God is Allah. So when I saw this Quran, I you know I felt positive about it, but. I think when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings somebody to Islam, and I think even when, whether that person is coming from within the faith and having their awakening, or whether it's somebody like myself who was from outside the faith and who came into Islam, there have to be two elements. Mm. There are those two, like two ingredients. You, you have two ingredients to make um, something amazing. And the first ingredient is the, the ilm, the knowledge. But then the second ingredient is the qalb. You have to have the qalb open and the ilm open in order for these two things to gel together to give people the journey into faith. You mean by qalb, the readiness? Yeah, the readiness, the, the iman, the, the readiness to embrace. Because people, I mean, if we look at, you know, ph philosophers, we find the Orientalists who knew a huge amount about Islam. So the ilm, they had the ilm but they didn't have the, 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 this wish to be Muslim. So I had some knowledge and her next door neighbor um, was a revert brother. Now we're talking back in the 1990s and reverts were a lot fewer and, and far between than uh, they are currently. So I'd said to her, okay, you've said to me, the, the Quran is the word of God and it's the truth, prove it. So she had the same response as the vicar had had. And she said, well, I don't actually know that much about Islam. Mm. However, I have this neighbor. So she made the connection. Yes, I have this neighbor. He's a revert brother. He'll be able to tell you your answers that you need. So we went to him and I asked him all the awkward questions. Prove that there's a God. Prove that this, this, this Quran you're telling me, prove it to me. Otherwise, I can read any book. I can read the horoscopes. If I, I can like it with my heart, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's any delil. Where's the proof? So he said, give me a few days. I'm going to go away and I'm just going to get some, some more knowledge myself, some more uh, wisdom myself. He came back and he brought... So he thought he needed to make some studies. He needed to check. He was, a, he was a guy who was very diligent. 
I was asking about proof. Um, this brother, mashallah, he was uh, he'd come into Islam through the root of Sufism. So he was a very spiritual brother, mashallah. But I was a very, okay, I need this in black and white. I need the proof. The spirituality for me comes later. So he comes back to me and he said, okay, I have some verses of the Quran. And so he told me and showed me the verses about the, the, the child being created in the womb of the mother, about the, uh, the, the mountains being the stakes mm. in the earth, many scientific facts out of the Quran. And I was amazed. And then he told me the key. He said, this was revealed to an illiterate man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the middle of a desert 1500 years ago. I couldn't believe it. However, we weren't quite there yet. <laughs> so the ilm was there. It's a process, isn't it? it? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what I say to people who are, who are giving da'wah. Sometimes people who are giving da'wah, they really get upset if that person doesn't embrace Islam. And I say to them, look, you are a piece in the jigsaw yeah. of this person's journey. And it's not your job to make people Muslim. It's your job to present, to invite, even if that's a smile. This small sadaqah that you give to somebody, that could open their heart to go and read something. It's How a long did it take you? How long did that process last? For me, not very long. Mm -hmm. Not very long. Because as soon as I had the, the knowledge, it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened a, 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 another door. So this brother said, look, have a look at this film. And it was a video in those days. I show youth a video now. They confused, video cassettes. Right? Video VHS, yeah, VHS video, absolutely. <laughs> and it was a rasala. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Long film, maybe three, three and a half hours long. I was a teenager. So I was in and out of the room where the, the film was being shown. Um, and so we watched this film for the evening and I was in and out, in and out. So remember, so far my journey, I've got the ilm and I, I'm convinced, but the qalb, it hasn't been ignited yet. Mm. Now, at the end of the film, there's this scene where Bilal عن, is on the top of the Kaaba mm. and he does the Adhan. I came into the room at the moment when Bilal is doing the Adhan on the top of the Kaaba and I heard this amazing sound and I didn't know a single word of what it meant. The Adhan. The Adhan. Mm. Every single hair on my body stood up and I got what I can only describe as a, a wash of Iman. Like almost this warm feeling traveling all the way through me. This was when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me the, the ta'am, the taste of Iman, the sweetness that the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks about, the sweetness of Iman. And so then, this is when I said, and I turned to my friend, I remember her face, and I said, if this is just the call to prayer, what about the rest of Islam? I want to be a Muslim and I want to do it now. Wow. What was her response? Fine. No problem. <laughs> no problem. So, of course, we went back to the brother and he invited us to the, uh, to the masjid. And I remember it was on a Thursday. Um, and I went down there and took my shahada and that's where my journey, alhamdulillah, as a Muslim began. And that's also where my journey of da'wah began. Now, how much uh, a change that meant in your life? I mean, let's begin first with your family. What was the, the response? How did they react to this? I think it's very important to note here that the, the context, the, the time context was before 9-11. So we're talking 1992. So there wasn't this fear and this demonizing of um, Muslims being terrorists, the idea of Muslim and Muslims and Islam being something to, to fear at that time. However, there was, of course, um, cultural difference. So Muslims were very much viewed as the other, you know, something different, not necessarily to be feared, but maybe a little bit backward, a little bit um, sort of primitive. 
So I remember coming and I actually came into this room here. Um, and my father... This was your family this house. This was our family house, yeah. absolutely. And my father was sitting and he was reading the newspaper. He was reading The Guardian. And I said to him, and, and I, I, my idea, because all my fr Muslim friends were Pakistani who weren't massively educated about Islam. So their idea... It's more culture than religion. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. their idea and what they were passing on to me in my earlier, earlier days of being a Muslim was, in order to be a Muslim, you've got to dress like a Pakistani. <laughs> so I put some salwar kameez on that had been donated by a friend who was, I must have, I'm, I'm about five foot six. My friend was five foot two. So I had these trousers on that was halfway up my leg, walked in on my father, dressed in these Pakistani clothes, and probably not very eloquently or elegantly announced that I decided, decided to become a Muslim. And all I could see was him lower the newspaper, sort of peer over the top, <laughs> and his eyebrows raised up. Really, dear, <laughs> he said. <laughs> so he was... He was kind of surprised, but not surprised, because I'd been a bit of a wild child as a, a teenager. Um, so and he probably thought this was a whim, another whim. This is another, it's exactly what he said to me. Hmm. This is another phase you're going through, dear. My mum, on the other hand, was concerned about not terrorism or anything negative like that. What she was concerned is that what she'd seen from the Muslim community in the UK was women walking five or six paces behind the husband, which in the, I, I don't see it nowadays. Then it was quite a common thing in the Muslim community. It was really cultural. Man. Absolutely yeah. cultural practice. So she'd seen this. She turned around to me and she said, well, you're going to end up walking six paces behind your husband and be tied into the house. Of course, the only way that I could show my parents that that was not going to be the case, because I wasn't the type of person who was ever going to be that person who would be, you know, sort of walking six paces behind the husband. I had to show them Islam. But of course, like many new Muslims, new Muslims at first tend to get a little bit evangelical mm. because we're so happy about our conversion to Islam that we want everybody around us to be Muslim as well. So we get a little bit over enthusiastic and a little bit pushy sometimes which can be kind of damaging. But subhanAllah, that didn't last for very long. Um, and and I, I had some very strong lessons of, uh, of da'wah at the time. So from I, fellow Muslims? Not from fellow Muslims, actually. I was really, at that point, quite isolated. And I've noticed um, that with new Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does sometimes give new, the new Muslims a period of time, a period of isolation. And I've noticed that this is a pattern. And I, when I look at um, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before he receives the wahi, before he receives the revelation, he has a period of reflection. He has a period of isolation away from society. So you look at this phase of isolation as a positive thing? Yes, many people look at it as a negative thing. Yeah, I heard, I heard stories Many about people this. look yeah. at it as a negative thing, but that's because we are almost told that isolation is a negative thing. I had the isolation and I was searching and I see now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he isolates somebody, whether it's a new Muslim or a born Muslim or, or, or somebody, very often it's because he wants us to turn to him alone for our hidayah, for our worship. Because we're very used to turning to other people. Nowadays, we'll turn to Facebook and we'll turn to Instagram and Google and all these different forums but how many of us can actually honestly say that first stop is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is very interesting because actually what happens if uh, you are uh, attached to a certain individual or to a certain institution that could backfire if you see something wrong, if you see misconduct on, on, on their behalf, 
So I think, I think this concept of isolation is a very interesting one. Mm, very much so. But what I was looking for, um, and this isolation maybe continued for about six months, and I wanted so badly to start practicing Islam. And I had some very early and very, very awkward moments of, of da'wah. I remember one time I was... I you was, mean you practicing me trying da'wah? To, me trying to give da'wah mm. as a non-practicing, non-hijabed. All I knew at this time was la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. <laughs> Bess. That's it. Mm. That's all I knew. And I, at the time I was living in a bed and breakfast place. Um, waiting for um, a longer term apartment to come through. And this bed and breakfast place was also a hotel, which had the hotel bar. Now, there was a guy who used to be the security at the hotel bar, who happened to be a Jehovah's Witness. Very, very nice guy. And so I used to go and get into dialogue with him about Islam and Christianity. And of course, as a Jehovah's Witness, mashallah, he, had a, to you. he had a <laughs> lot of knowledge mm. about Christianity and about being a Jehovah's Witness. And I had la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And he literally chewed me up and spat me out. Wow. But it made me determined to gather knowledge. And I also was desperate to learn how to pray. But the people around me, you know, there's two types of inshallah, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's the Muslimic inshallah, which generally means, actually, I probably can't do this. And then there's the Islamic inshallah, which means I will do this unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stops me in some way. So my friends used to use the Muslimic inshallah. Make promises, but not make fulfill. Make promise, but not, because they couldn't. Mm. Teach me the salah, please. Teach me how to pray. Show me how to be a Muslim, inshallah. And I'd wait and I'd get frustrated. Perhaps because they themselves were not they uh, practicing. They weren't. They yeah. had the best intentions. They were amazing sisters. But they, they didn't know how to pray themselves. But they didn't. They felt embarrassed. Yeah, we have a proverb in Arabic that says, if, if you're missing something, you cannot give it. Exactly. Exactly. So um, what happened is I ended up doing the correct thing, which was making du'a. To ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, please show me Islam. Show me how to be a good Muslim. Show me how to pray. You did, you never occurred to you that there were Islamic centers, for instance, or a community? No, not at that point. Oh, no. Not no. at that point in time. So I ended up um, meeting with uh, a sister called Tracy who was also a revert, and she ended up being my mentor. And this was purely through du'a that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent me. Actually, you remember the old phone boxes? Mm. So I went down to a phone box and there was a, a guy in the phone box. And he was, he, he was kind of, it was a rough area I lived in and he was kind of scary, this guy. And he's staring at me like this out of the phone box. He's about six foot two, six foot three. And he looked through the phone box at me and suddenly the door opened of the phone box and he said, Are you Muslim? And at this point I was terrified. I thought I'm going to get mugged, something's going to happen to me, I'm going to get attacked. What was he? Was he... He was a big, big, white person? A, a big mixed uh, race guy, mixed very race. tall mixed race guy. Not dressed as a How Muslim. How did he guess you were a Muslim? I was wearing my Pakistani clothes again. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I sort of stood there and went, yeah. He said, wait there. At this point, I, it was either stop or run. I was frozen into, onto the spot. And he dialed a number in the phone box, stuck the phone out of the door and said, here, speak to Sister Tracy. Wow. It turned out that this was also a revert brother who had recently become Muslim, could see that I was a revert, knew this sister, mm. look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took me to this phone box, two minutes either side, he would be gone. Shh. Subhanallah. Allah answered your dua. Answered my dua. Mm. But he didn't answer my dua until I asked him directly. Subhanallah. It is uh, strange that uh, in that uh, early period, you did not receive sufficient support from, from the Muslim community. 
usually Muslims when they hear of a sister or a brother who have converted to Islam they'd be jubilant about this they'd be so happy and welcoming and want to do whatever they, they could but it's probably the locality you, you were in at the time. There were a lot of Muslims in the locality and I knew a lot of Muslims um, but I didn't know the type of Muslims who could help me with that journey so you know I learned how to be a very efficient Pakistani but I wasn't able to learn how to pray and do, you know, practice Islam because basically the people who I was mixing with weren't practicing Muslims and didn't have that knowledge. But actually, again, Sister Tracy, you know, started to teach me how to pray. But there was one amazing thing that happened that brought me into praying full time. And this was probably all around the same time. So the Pakistani family that I knew had uh, their uncle who would come into the house every day. He would make wudu at the kitchen sink and then he would come into the room and he would make his salah. And I used to watch him and I would want to learn. Mm. Oh, I really want to learn how to do this. I said, this is why I'd be asking my friends. Subhanallah, the brother had a heart attack and passed away. Allah rahmah. Now, Culturally, English people are terrified of death. We run away from death or any type of association. But the Muslim community, very different, especially the Pakistani community, are very close and very coherent and positive when it comes to, um, you know, dealing with death, dealing with the body, etc. So my friend said, look, you know, he, he really respected you for becoming Muslim. Please come. Come to this janaza. Oh, and she invited you to come. She invited mm. me mm. to her. It was her father. Mm. Um, and so I went and there was a, a living room, very much like we're sitting in now, full of people, full of ladies. And in the middle of the living room was the, the coffin on a stand. And I looked at this coffin. I was terrified because I'd never seen a dead person before. Never. Not even on the TV. So she led me over to this coffin and I didn't want to look. And she said, it's okay. And I looked down, I eventually opened my, my eyes and I looked down into this coffin and this brother had the most amazing noor in his face. And he was smiling. Allah rahmu. And at the same time as I saw his face, I remembered his salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had shown me, you established that, then this is how your death will look. Wow. Inshallah ta'ala. So this was like a message. Uh, uh, so exactly. Mm. So after that moment, until now, I didn't miss a salah. Subhanallah. So I learned to pray with a book in my hand and it was difficult at first, tough, the Arabic and the, the pronunciation. But this was my journey into being a practicing Muslim. And mashallah, you've come a long way. I mean, Alhamdulillah. You, you are now a scholar. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, where did you learn your Arabic, by the way? Well, I was living for a couple of years in, uh, in Yemen. Mm. And uh, I was also where the, in the area that I used to live in, um, my neighbor, um, amazing sister, um, was a Yemeni lady who didn't speak any English. And I like to talk. So it was either talk to the neighbor in Arabic or don't talk. So you had no choice. So I had no <laughs> choice but to talk. To so she taught me so much Arabic and of obviously being immersed in the community, being active in da'wah. Mm. Um, and then, of course, um, when I was learning about Islam, um, you know, a lot of the scholars that I learned from were Arabic scholars, uh, learning down in Markfield. We used to have long weekends where the scholars used to come and teach us and, and of course, learning a lot of Arabic from that. And then, of course, the path of da'wah, I think it's something for, the, for most of the du'at, it's something that you, you don't plan. You make your intention and you say, Ya Allah, just take me and use me for your work. And this was my intention. Use me for your work. Well, Sister Amina, it's really a great pleasure to talk to you. 
Likewise. Jazakallah. Thank you very much. Thank you.